Today, we're going to learn how to teach math using materials published by Art of Problem Solving. You might know that you can learn math at AOPS from taking one of their online classes, or you can study math at an AOPS Academy if you have one in your area. We're going to focus on how to study AOPS at home using the textbooks or an ebook. My parents asked me whether they should use the electronic version of the book or a paper textbook. Both versions of the books contain the same content, the same problem the same exercises, pretty much everything is the same. The ebooks will never expire for a username. So if you want to use an ebook with more than one student, it's probably best to assign it to a parent and then give each student access to their account. Ebooks are also more portable. You can read them from your phone or a laptop. So if you'll be traveling, the ebook might be a better option. With the paper textbooks, you'll obviously have less screen time if that's a concern. And I often find them easier to read. One big difference between the ebooks and the paper textbooks is the ebooks embed videos produced by Richard Ruxick into the books themselves. These same videos are still available to anybody. Just go to the AOPS website, click on resources, and look for videos, and you'll find the same ones there. You should know that the videos are only available in three of the textbooks, pre-algebra, algebra, and counting a probability. There are no videos for the other textbooks. I'm going to take you through a sample lesson using an AOPS textbook. I'll be using images from the ebooks, but you'll find the same information in the paper textbooks as well. In my example, I'm going to teach a lesson from chapter 10 of Introduction to Algebra. Many of my parents will tell me that the AOPS textbook is written to the student, which they interpret to mean that they can just give the book to the student and have them work independently. Some students certainly are able to do this, but I think most students, even in high school, need guidance from a tutor or a teacher. This is pretty critical because we don't want to let our students discover incorrect information. It's much harder to correct a student who thinks something is wrong is actually right than to give them the right information in the first place. So we're gonna provide some active teaching when we introduce our students to these topics. Let's start with chapter 10. Notice each chapter is divided up into sections, number 10.1, 10.2, etc. Each section is divided divided into two parts, problems and exercises. The problems introduce new material, and the exercises are for the students to perform independent practice. Let's take a look at section 10.1. Here is chapter 10, section 10.1 of Introduction to Algebra. Notice that there are five introductory problems. These problems guide the student to understanding the information that they need to solve quadratic equations. Let's take a look at the first problem, 10.1. Most students will need a teacher to guide them through the problems because this is new material. So when I'm working with a student, I will copy down the problem to be solved, which is the values of x that satisfy this equation. I'll ask the student if they know a solution to this equation. Hopefully they'll recognize that 4 squared is equal to 16, so a solution for x is x equals 4. If they don't know the solution, I might ask them, is there a number multiplied by itself that gives the result of 16? Or provide other scaffolding. If they stop at x equals 4, I'll remind them that there is a second solution to this equation and see if they can recall what that solution might be. If they don't, I might provide some additional Socratic scaffolding. I might ask the student if there are any solutions that are negative. I might need to remind them that the product of two negative numbers is a positive number, but I don't sweat it too much. If they don't remember, I'll go ahead and offer what is negative 4 times negative 4. Hopefully they'll tell me it's 16 and we found our second solution. When I finish with this part of the problem, I recommend that you go to the solution. Let's do that now. In the ebook, to get to the solution, you'll see a jump to solution link at the top of the problem. In the regular paper textbooks, you'll find the solutions to the introductory problems immediately following the last problem. Here is the solution. And let's take a closer look. Here we have nicely detailed explanation of the solution, explaining that x equals 4 and x equals negative 4 is a solution. There's also a box here that explains the use of of this plus or minus sign. So x is equal to plus or minus 4 is equivalent to saying x equals 4 and x equals negative 4. So it's helpful to look at the solution to see if there's any information that you might have missed. Another reason to check the solution is there's often a little bridge here where they introduce this idea that a linear term cannot be solved this way. And this takes us to the next problem, problem 10.2. So repeat the process 
with these remaining problems. With problem 10.2, try to guide the student to the correct answer, and then take a quick look at the solution to make sure you haven't missed anything, and repeat until you've completed all of the problems. Again, the problems present introductory material, and I recommend that the teacher or parent present this material to the student directly. After all the problems have been completed, section 10.1 ends with several practice exercises. These exercises I assign to the students to complete independently on their own. Either the same day or the following day, have your student write out the solutions to the problems on notebook paper. If they're using the ebook, they can enter in a solution into this blank. Then this button will light up, which says show solution, and the solution will appear on the screen. If you're using a paper textbook, make sure, in addition to the regular textbook, that you also order a copy of the solutions manual so that you can check the answers to your students' exercises. Let's take a look at a sample exercise. Here's the problem, the first exercise Size from section 10.1. It's number 10.1.1 and the problem statement is here. I have copied over here the AOPS solution to problem 10.1.1. It gives a detailed description of how to solve the problem. I do not expect my students to write the solution themselves. For example, if a student started with the problem statement and then wrote that x squared is therefore equal to 900 and this is equal to the product of these two perfect squares and then x is equal to plus or minus 30, that's fine. They don't have to write out all of these complete sentences. If a student or parent is grading the exercise, they can usually skip over the explanation and go straight to the boxed answer. If it matches what the student wrote, that's sufficient, and you can go on to the next exercise. But check carefully. Make sure the student, for example, only found one of the solutions. You want to make sure that the student understands that the negative version of the number is also a solution, and make that correction quickly. This is why I recommend that you grade and provide feedback as soon as possible. This prevents students from having an incorrect idea sitting in their brain overnight, and they'll learn this material much faster. And that's it for section 10.1, introductory problems done with the teacher, followed by exercises completed independently. Once you finish section 10.1, repeat this process for section 10.2 and 10.3, etc. You'll notice that section 10.5 has a star beside it. This probably means that in most schools, this would be considered extra and perhaps skippable, especially if you are short on time. But really, it's this, these more unusual, challenging problems that are the secret sauce for AOPS. If you're short on time, you're probably better off using another their curriculum. Once you've finished all of these sections in chapter 10, you'll get the last section, which is the summary. Let's take a look. Here's the first part of the summary for chapter 10. It recaps all of the critical information that was taught in this chapter. It's probably worthwhile to review this material with your student. The second half of the summary is this list of problem-solving strategies. Some of this advice is helpful, but a lot of it is really kind of meta. Here's a good example. Organize expressions and equations into familiar forms you know how to handle. Yes, I think that's good advice, but I'm not really sure how useful that's going to be to a student. Here's another example of advice that's just a little too abstract. But first, you don't know how to solve a problem. Don't just stare at it, experiment. No one can argue with this advice, but I just think it's too meta to be useful for most students. Let's go on to the last sections. These are the review problems and the challenge problems. Let's take a look at the review problems for chapter 10. Here they are. There are a lot of them. Do not skip the review problems at the end of each chapter. You'll notice that in the individual sections, there were a handful of exercises and not really enough practice for most students. To really seal their understanding, it's important for students to work through all of these review problems. Review problems vary in length. Depending on how many they are, I set aside between one and three days to complete the review problems. For example, if I ask my student to complete half of the review problems on the first day, that same day I will check the problems with the solution manual. I want to make sure my student completely understands how to solve all of these problems and not keep any incorrect information in their heads overnight. And repeat the same thing with the second half on the second day. After the review problems are challenge problems. Here are the challenge problems for chapter 10 of Introduction to Algebra. We see that there are fewer of them. If you would set aside, say, three days for your student to complete the review problems, you might only need two days to complete all the challenge problems. You might see that some of these problems have stars next to them, meaning they're probably even more challenging than usual. I would encourage your students to give 
these a go, they might surprise you and themselves if they're able to solve them. If you're short on time, these are probably skippable, but really it's the challenging problems that are the secret sauce of AOPS. So if you're skipping the hardest problems, then you're not getting the full benefit and maybe another curriculum is a better fit for your student. And that's it for chapter 10. After that, we go on to chapter 11, section 11.1 .1, with the introductory problems and then the exercises as homework, repeating for each of these sections, taking a look at the summary and reviewing the important information, and then spending a couple of days on the review problems and a couple of days on the challenge problems and keep repeating until you've completed the textbook. AOPS requires extra time and extra effort, but the academic preparation is unsurpassed. Good luck using AOPS at home. If you have any questions about the art of problem solving or any math contests, please leave them in the comments.